One more time. Ah, there we go. (laughs) Welcome to the St Hilary's podcast, where the two revs ask the questions. Sometimes we even answer them. Indeed. Well, happy Mother's to you, um, to everyone here, and also to you, Kate. Oh, thank you. Um, And also my mum, if you're listening. (laughs) Being a mum is certainly an adventure. So in response to listener requests, today we're thinking about the topic, should Christians celebrate Mother's Day? But I would have thought the answer was pretty obvious, right? I mean, what's the harm? I imagine this might be a very short sermon podcast. You might be right. (laughs) I mean, if we look at the Ten Commandments, the command to honour your mother and father, it's right up there at number five. So I guess celebrating Mother's Day once a year kind of fits in with that. Uh, My mum had four kids to deal with. That's a lot of dedication to raising us over many years. Kind of feels only right to remember all that sacrifice at least once a year and find some way of um, giving thanks for that. Yeah, true. And, and the Bible's full of exhortations to believers to cultivate hearts of gratitude. I mean, Thessalonians, give thanks in all circumstances. Of course, the emphasis for thanksgiving in Scripture is being thankful to God, but it does make sense that that attitude of gratitude would overflow to others too, like our mums. Yeah, and another thing is that in many cultures, respecting elders is a deeply held value. And I think that perhaps we've lost that a bit in our Western individualistic uh, anti-authoritarian culture. But I think even in many parts of Asia... Or even in Arnhem Land, where we worked, I think respecting your mum's a really big thing. So, yeah, I guess Mother's Day is consistent with the idea of respect. I reckon to intentionally set aside... A day to honour mothers in a society, uh, it cultivates a healthy attitude to mothers, uh, especially as we live in an age where dedicating time to raising kids can often lose out to paid work. Uh, Basically, Mother's Day seems good to me. Good for florists, (laughs) card makers, homeware stores, clothing stores, chocolate makers. (laughs) It's even good for sloths. Sorry, what? Did you say good for sloths? (laughs) Yeah, I came came across this the other week. The Sloth Conservation Foundation is encouraging people to adopt a sloth for Mother's Day. That is terrible. (laughs) Listen to this. This is on their website. Sloths are the slowest mammals on the planet. They do everything all at the same measured pace. This isn't laziness but rather an incredibly successful strategy for survival. That is terrible. I'm I'm not sure how my mum would take it if I gave her a sloth for Mother's Day. (laughs) Yeah, true, but it is funny. Okay, all right, but the basic question seems straightforward. Apart from someone's possibly insulting idea of adopting a sloth, there's no real harm in it, is there? Case closed, yeah? Yeah. It seems fine for Christians to have a day each year where we celebrate mothers. Well, (laughs) to tell you the truth, I'm I'm probably a bit more ambivalent about the whole thing than you seem. I mean, please don't get me wrong. I don't resent spoiling my mum. I really don't. But I'm just not sure that the question of whether Mother's Day is inherently Christian is that straightforward. Uh, How so? I, I I would have thought most Christians would be all for celebrating something like this talking on the phone or getting together for a meal, celebrate someone who's played such a pivotal role in their lives. It's good for mums and good for the economy. That's it, right there. It might be good for the economy, but the commercialism, it just irritates me. I mean, I think Christians have got good reason to be cynical when shops push something harder than the rest of society. Of course, I mean, the tension has been in the DNA right from the beginning of Mother's Day. What do you mean by it's in the DNA? So the closest link to our... I did a bit of homework on this. The closest link to our version of Mother's Day has its history in the calls for peace following the American Civil War. Women united to nurse wounded soldiers and they did this valuable work and they supported one another, especially the mothers who were grieving loss of children and husbands. And in 1908, there was a woman named Anna Jarvis from West Virginia... She held a memorial service because she wanted to honour the legacy of her mum in doing that work. 
and is campaigning to have a day set aside to honour the work of mothers succeeded in 1914 when the US president officially declared the second Sunday in May to be Mother's Day. So what you're telling me is that Mother's Day is just an American thing. (laughs) (laughs) Well, (laughs) but actually in Australia, the origins of Mother's Day are similarly noble. Okay. Like in the aftermath of World War I, there was a Sydney woman named Janet Hayden and she started the tradition because she was actually concerned for all the mothers who were no longer mothers. Uh, She was visiting people in hospital and who were really grieving and... So many wives were now widowed because of the war. So many women never had the prospect of becoming mothers or wives because a whole generation of men had been wiped out. So Janet campaigned for a day to recognise the role and contribution of mothers here too. Wow, that is a really good story and quite a biblical response, taking care of widows. But how does the commercialism fit in with that DNA? Well, as you can imagine, it was not long after it was declared, Anna Jarvis herself began to protest. She started calling it Hallmark Sunday because she felt the day had been completely hijacked. It's so human, don't you think, to just hijack a noble thing with ignoble motives like making money. Did you know that Australians spend about a billion dollars on Mother's Day every year? No, I did not know that. It's a lot of money. Yeah. But as you say it, I can see how hard the shops, they try to direct our efforts into having to buy something for our mother. It does sometimes feel a bit like tokenism when you think about the message of the advertising, which definitely equates kind of love for mum with buying something for mum. That's it. I mean, that's it exactly. And I think it's right for Christians to be reluctant, if not fully against something that's just propagating an obviously impoverished view of real love in relationships. Plus, as a mum, like, it's kind of heart-wrenching when your child has spent all their pocket money on something absolutely hideous (laughs) (laughs) because the world tells them that's how you show love to your (laughs) mum. Remember the yellow earrings? (laughs) Can we not talk about the yellow earrings? (laughs) Okay. I think I know what you mean, though. When I, when I look at some of the messaging around the day, I do feel like we've been guilted into tokenism. Exactly. I saw this ad during the week. Um, can we go a bit gruen? Sure. Uh, take a look at this. Okay. I like how it shows a diversity of mums and what they do for their kids. That's that's good. Oh, really? <laughs> the rising music's a bit manipulative, don't you think? There it is. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> you know it'd get there. <laughs> you knew it was going to get there, didn't there you? There was something like, at who, the end. I just can't help but feel it kind of wallpapers over the imperfections and disappointments and it's just like it elevates motherhood into something that's completely unrealistic. Uh, which is classic social media, right? It might be a horrendous holiday overall, but the sun came out for 10 minutes and a perfect shot presto you know countryside social media often gives the impression everything's rosy when it's not really and as they say comparison is the thief of joy I think it's worse than that I mean that ad is awful objectification like that just robs everyone of a picture of reality I mean at the start of this sermon we were were kind of saying like you know what's the harm but I think there's real harm in an ad like that I mean been thinking about the Ten Commandments in this sermon series. 
do not covet is right up there, but that ad is just setting up the whole world to be utterly disappointed in each other and to covet those unreal mothers. And, oh, my goodness, like... I just think the best of women in history are still imperfect and human and good enough at best. And I can't decide if that ad is idolatry or it's just robbing every woman everywhere of ever being good enough. <laughs> well, that's, uh, that's a stronger reaction than I was expecting. <laughs> maybe, maybe we need to talk. Um, about your experience. Um, though I'm aware that for many people, Mother's Day is actually a really difficult day uh, for a diversity of reasons. And it's, it's not straightforward where the churches should celebrate. I think for, for some, Mother's Day touches on the experience of grief that their mum has died. Uh, for others, Mother's Day heightens feelings of loss uh, for the parent they'd wish they had and, in, and may result in misplaced resentment of friends uh, who post or boast sentimental or happy stories. I get that for many people there might be this disconnect. Um, they might feel pressure that everyone should be happy and thankful for their mother. Um, but maybe, maybe that's not appropriate. I don't know. Yeah, I think that's right. And exalting an impoverished relationship doesn't make it healthy. The pressure, I think, to... to kind of make Mother's Day relationships feel so perfect. You know, it's so far from the origin story of Mother's Day or even our origin story. It just makes me wonder how helpful it is for churches to be part of a Mother's Day bandwagon. All right. So maybe celebrating Mother's Day as it currently is, uh, is not helpful. So where are we at? We started out thinking there's no harm in Christians celebrating, but the count of you shouldn't be ignored Christians shouldn't ignore the truth of our relationship. So what are you saying? Are we, are we going to cancel it? Please don't tell me we have to cancel, I must say, the fabulous morning tea that our wonderful <laughs> hospitality team have put on. No. <laughs> no to denouncing Mother's Day or no to calling off morning tea? <laughs> Both. I definitely think the morning tea should stay. People might need it after this, but... <laughs> Maybe the thing to do is for us to refine the question. Um, maybe the worthwhile question for us is really, what would thoughtful Christian engagement with Mother's Day look like? Yeah, that's good. And I think we've seen three perspectives uh, in our conversation that offer Christian way forward about how we engage with cultural practices like Mother's Day or even Father's Day. And so, number one, the number one thing is this... Uh, out of three. We need to live in the tension. Just as Paul tells the Christians in Rome to rejoice with those who rejoice and, th and mourn with those who mourn, uh, we need to be people who can give thanks and praise for the good and also lament the bad. Christians need to refuse these kind of shallow responses to complex questions. And I think that's part of what it means to speak the truth in love. In its context, the Bible uses that phrase uh, as the antidote to being like infants tossed back and forth by every wind of opinion. And I think it, I think it takes maturity uh, to hold those two things uh, which are in tension together. It's a hard thing, isn't it, to hold things that feel like opposites together. Yeah, you want to celebrate and you also want to um, mourn with those who mourn. So as a mature, mature Christian, I'm not going to be held hostage uh, refusing to give thanks for the love my mum did her best to give me, uh, just because I can acknowledge that she wasn't uh, perfect and she didn't meet all my needs. Um, we can kind of be in that, that place. So, And if your relationship with your mum uh, is painful, I think it's important for you to hear this morning that the command to uh, honour your mother, mother and father is not asking you to pretend uh, they were perfect or even deserving of thanks in some cases. But don't let lamenting that rob you of anything that was good. That's really important, I think, to hear. That that's not what it's saying. Yeah. So as a Christian community, we need to grow in our capacity to welcome both good experiences and the difficult experiences of family. We need to strengthen our ability to listen and lament with those who need to mourn. And even while we rejoice with those 
who have something to rejoice in. So that's my first point, really. Uh, Let's get better, both individually and as a church, at holding together these tensions of our differing experiences. Yeah, thanks, Tav. I mean, that offers helpful balance. And I think take-home number two follows on from that, which is about discernment. I mean, as followers of Jesus, we need to remember not to look to our mothers or our fathers for what only God can give. We heard Psalm 139 read before, and it's such a profound reminder of the physicality and the role of mothers in bringing a child into the world. And I really love that scripture isn't silent, but it it actually affirms so much of my experience of mothering. The Bible addresses the pain of childbirth, the vulnerability of mothers and of infants in the early years of life. So there's something that feels right about acknowledging that amazing and sacrificial act of service that's been shown by a mother to her children even before they're born. Thanks, Mum. But I think it would be really remiss if anyone went home today with the impression that Psalm 139 is an ode to mothers. It's not. It's a love song to God. For you, God, formed my inmost parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb and I praise you, Lord, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. I think in preparing for today, I I saw one ad that swapped out the phrase, just a mom, with just a life giver, a first love, a last hope, a teacher, a provider, a healer, a BFF, a therapist, their whole world. And it went on and on, culminating with the words, just a creator. I think it goes too far. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, obviously the ad draws on poetic licence, but that way of talking about our mums, I think is actually betraying the deep human longing which we have, which no mother can actually ever fulfil. Of course, we know our mothers are not actually God, but for so many of us, it's such a deep disappointment that our mothers are not perfect, not able to meet all our needs. And I think godly discernment calls us to recognise that While it was legitimate to want our mothers to meet our needs, ultimately that desire is pointing to its perfect fulfilment, which will only be found in Jesus Christ. So I I think this points to one really good response for us on Mother's Day, which is to pray for our parents. Pray especially for your mother on Mother's Day. Pray for your father on Father's Day. I I think the highest honour we can pay to our parents is to pray for them. Yeah. And I think that's even more true if they were the enemies of our well-being. Even if your mother's no longer alive, I think it's right to bring the complicated mess of real family life to God in prayer. So I commend this to you as a good way to remember Mother's Day today. I think that's right. Complex issues need discerning responses, Mm. which leads nicely into the, uh, the final point. Practice wisdom... It's the path to life. Mm. The command to Israel to honour your parents is perhaps best understood in the genre of a wisdom command. As a pattern for life, to honour foundational relationships is a wise way to live. That's why Paul writes that this is the first commandment with a promise attached. Uh, You will prosper and live a long, full life if you honour your parents. So that's the secret. To like you know, long life <laughs> might be one of them. Uh, <laughs> Ephesians six three. So he's not giving them the formula for a long life. He's reminding them of wisdom. Mm. The message is to respect the role of parents. And that's the right way for God's covenant people to live. Again, it says in Proverbs, pay pay close attention, my child, to your father's father's wise words, and never forget your mother's instructions. For their insight will bring you success, adorning you with grace-filled thoughts and giving you reins to guide your decisions. But how we live this command out obviously needs discernment because the Bible is absolutely not saying that every bit of advice uh, from every parent is wise and ought to be obeyed without question. The command to honour your parents does not give a parent a licence for Mm -hmm. bad Mm behaviour. So let me say this, I believe there are circumstances where it's okay not to visit or call your mum on Mother's Day, such as if it will 
um, cause more harm than good. As God's covenant people, our family relationships are important, and in a perfect world, they would be that picture of God's love for us as his children. But it may be that better than a gift card uh, or sending your mum chocolate, uh, perhaps is something like a call uh, to get help, maybe from a trained counsellor. That could be, in some cases, the most loving thing you could do for yourself and also for your relationship with your mum. And by working on your relationship in this way, it's likely you'll improve uh, other important relationships in your life as well. Mm, those foundational relationships, they really set a pattern, don't they? They do. So also how it looks to on your parents will change from when you're uh, young, obviously, and when you're much older. Yet despite these caveats, there's still a rightness today in general to children, on your parents, as parents are to teach their children how to live in healthy uh, relationship with God. Yeah, that's a really good reminder about the impact of genre. Um, it's good to be reminded that as Christians, we're not meant to check our brains out at the door. <laughs> so as we finish, let me remind, like, can we go back to those three suggestions for thoughtful engagement with the cultural tradition of Mother's Day? First one is live in the tension we give thanks for the good and we lament the not so good. We hold it together. Um, second one, remember that God is the provider of our needs and it's ultimately only him that will actually fulfill that need and desire we have. And third one, practice wisdom because that's the path to life. Well, I hope you've enjoyed wrestle, wrestling with us about this topic as much as we've enjoyed preparing for it. Um, there's been, it's a good thing the walls in the rectory are thick because <laughs> it's been robust. Um, <laughs> thanks for tuning into the podcast and don't forget, like and subscribe. <laughs> and and of course, don't forget the, uh, the show notes. What? We don't have any show notes. <laughs> what is that?